Swami Tragunatita embodied tremendous spiritual power, a tower of strength and a bundle of energy. He was in every way an ideal disciple of the master he adored, Sri Ramakrishna, and vowed to serve and dedicate his life to him and his mission of awakening the spiritual consciousness of humanity. This Swami Trigunatita fulfilled until his last breath. A man whose thoughts were big and whose personality was larger than life prompted one of his closest disciples, Carl Peterson, to remark, that strong will, that energy, that could not be broken by anything, that was Swami Trigunatita. Our story begins on April 14, 1900, when immediately following Swami Vivekananda's last public lecture in San Francisco, a handful of his devoted students urged him to form a society for the continued study of Vedanta. Swamiji readily agreed, and thus the Vedanta Society of San Francisco was officially founded with the purpose to assist Swami Vivekananda in his work in India and to study the Vedanta philosophy. And what a beginning it would turn out to be. From a small seed came such a large tree. Swamiji left California at the end of May 1900. Before leaving, he had requested a brother monk, Swami Turiyananda, to continue the work in California. Swami Turiyananda traveled from New York, arriving in San Francisco in July 1900, expressly to develop a tract of land for a retreat where serious students could learn to meditate under the guidance of the great Swami. The property would be christened by Swami Turiyananda Shanti Ashrama and would become a contemplative retreat of the San Francisco Vedanta Society. Some of the students were known to Swami Vivekananda. Some were to become Swami Turiyananda's disciples, while others would in time become deeply devoted to Swami Trigunatita. These early students, among whom were the Petersons, the Wahlbergs, the Frenches, and the Allens formed the connecting thread, the foundation of what was to become the Vedanta Society of Northern California. In 1902, when Swami Turiyananda's health began to fail, Swami Vivekananda recalled him to India. Swamiji chose Swami Trigunatita to take his place. Swami Trigunatita was the third disciple of Sri Ramakrishna to come to San Francisco. The society was thrice blessed. The Swami arrived on January 2nd, 1903, a day ahead of time. While a coincidence, this was an indicator of the Swami's prompt and methodical, methodical manner that became one of his well-known traits. Sister Gargi portrayed a colorful picture of East meeting West at the dock in San Francisco. Wearing a bright Garawa robe and a tall, complexly wound turban, the young Swami, he was just 37, was met by soberly dressed members of the Vedanta Society, <laughs> the men in dark suits, their shirt collars high and stiff, the women also soberly attired, except for hats festive with flowers, fruits, and feathers. 
Mr. Thomas Allen, devoted friend of Swami Vivekananda and later a disciple of Swami Trigunatita, noted that in the absence of a leader, the Vedanta class had dwindled. That was an understatement. The attendance was now three. <laughs> but these three were tenacious enough to keep the class alive. With his natural dynamism, Swami Trigunatita plunged into the work, earnestly fanning the smoldering embers of the fire that Swami Vivekananda and Swami Turiyananda had lit. His purpose of coming to the West was clear to him from the very beginning. To establish Swami Vivekananda's work of spreading the ancient universal philosophy of Vedanta to combine the best of the East with the best of the West, to promote respect for and harmony among all religions, but foremost, to help people become spiritual, to become aware of their innate divinity. Naturally, he would meet with opposition, all pioneers do, but he never faltered. One of his disciples, Kara French, recalled, with Swami, the purpose to do a thing was synonymous with the act, and the means to do were never lacking. Through his untiring efforts, Swami Trigunatita established the Vedanta Society, putting it on a firm and unshakable foundation. Initially, the Swami stayed in Dr. Milburn Logan's house on the northeast corner of Oak and Steiner Streets, just as had Swami Vivekananda and Swami Tudiananda. Though thoroughly renovated over the years, the original house associated with these three direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna is still standing. There, the fledgling society began to take wing. Quickly, Swami Trigunatita energized and reorganized the society from the bottom up. Shortly thereafter, the Swami and the headquarters of the society shifted to the Petersons' flat on Buchanan Street in a section of the city known as Cow Hollow because dairymen had settled there with their cattle. Cow Hollow would be the fortunate location of the future Hindu temple. The Petersons, Carl and Bertha, were quite extraordinary devotees and spiritual personalities in their own right. They would live with Swami Trigunatita and play a pivotal role in his ministry for his entire life in San Francisco. The Swami held classes at their home and also began outreaching in downtown San Francisco, giving public lectures in Union Square Hall where Swami Vivekananda also gave a series of talks. There was a terrific power behind Swami Trigunatita's words. The force of his personality and purity of character had a profound impact on his listeners. Later, when he asked a student to critique his talks, it was mentioned to him that he had a tremor in his voice. He tried hard to control it and then admitted that as he spoke, he saw the Divine Mother and was overcome with emotion. As one of our Swamis once said of him, he was a knower of God, speaking of God. His lectures were not just talk. Slowly the membership increased requiring larger quarters. Again, the society shifted. This time, the Petersons and the Swami moved to a flat on Steiner Street, having moved from one end of town to the other 
and back again. There was nothing static about Swami Trigunatita ever. Vedanta was taking root in the city by the bay as interest grew in the classes on meditation in the Bhagavad Gita. The Swami was vigorously extending the work in all directions. Kara French wrote in her reminiscences, Swami came and went amongst us all so freely, always busy with plans for the work, yet ever ready to banter, to tease, and woe betides anyone who thought to get the best of him. His flashing wit and swift repartee caught and silenced one, yet all in pure fun. The Swami's plans were infinitely expansive. In the latter part of 1903, he now conceived of having a separate building, a temple for the society's headquarters. For the Swami to think was to act. Soon, a suitable location was found on the southwest corner of Webster and Filbert Streets in Cow Hollow, which in the early 1900s was very near the San Francisco Bay. Swami Trigunatita immediately began making bold plans for the construction of what he was now calling, with pride and unabashed enthusiasm, the first Hindu temple in the whole Western world. Mr. Joseph Leonard, the architect who built the temple, admitted that he had learned far more from the Swami about the temple's design and construction than the Swami had from him. Such was always the case with Swami Trigunatita. The temple was an important symbol for him of India's vast spiritual wisdom, its universality and acceptance of all religions as valid paths to the same goal. This he intended to seamlessly blend into American culture and society. The cornerstone was laid in August 1905 and with the concentration of an Indian yogi and the Swami's no-nonsense direction and supervision, the temple was built, finished, and occupied before Christmas, an astonishing four months later. The temple was originally two stories. The upper story was an apartment for the Petersons, the lower story, or first floor, was the auditorium and Swami Trigunatita's quarters and office. Always austere, the Swami would roll out a mat and sleep on the office floor. The temple was solemnly dedicated in January 1906. The local newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, finally having some esoteric news to print, had a heyday. <laughs> a large photograph of the temple with its three Moorish style windows adorning the auditorium and its single Bengali tower accompanied an interview with the Swami. He began by addressing San Franciscans as my dear friends of America, my dear friends, of the great land of liberty, and then went on to explain what Vedanta is, its aim and purpose, emphasizing the unity behind all apparent diversity. The next day, the Chronicle announced, to the continued amazement of its conservative readers, dedication of first Hindu temple New auditorium of temple is crowded to doors with spectators who follow the exercises closely. The Swami printed a small booklet for the dedication entitled, A Souvenir from the Hindu Temple, 
about the absolute liberty of the soul. It contained a short article, What is Vedanta? Quotations from Vedantic scriptures, sayings of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda, as well as a brief idea of the society and its activities. When the temple was finished, the Swami had earnestly remarked, believe me, if there is the least tinge of selfishness in building this temple, it will fall. But if it is the master's work, it will stand. Three months after the dedication, the great earthquake and fire of San Francisco in 1906 <coughs> swept through the city, putting the Swami's declaration to the ultimate test. San Francisco was jolted by a severe 48-second shaking, which destroyed a good part of the city. A swift northeast wind propelled a wall of fire a mere six blocks east of the temple, its destruction imminent. The minutes of the society described the agonizing suspense. And then the wind shifted in another direction. The minutes continued, notwithstanding the awful calamity, by the grace of God, the Hindu temple was spared. The temple stood unscathed. Swami Trigunatita wrote to a friend in India about the terrible devastation in the city and then concluded, but through Thakur's wonderful grace, no harm has been done to our temple or to ourselves. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Four months later, in August 1906, Swami Prakashananda, a disciple of Swami Vivekananda, arrived to assist with the classes and lectures. He was a quiet, gentle, loving soul, well-versed in Sanskrit, with a melodious voice. Very soon, the Swami was working right alongside Swami Trigunatita, teaching that self-realization is the highest purpose of life. The following year, a third floor and three large towers were added to the temple, <laughs> and a fourth tower over the Filbert Street entrance, giving the temple not only added grandeur, but an extraordinarily exotic appearance in the midst of homely cow hollow. The Swami's main reason for this addition was his fervent wish to bring Swami Brahmananda, the president of the Ramakrishna order in India, for a visit. Unfortunately, this plan never materialized. Swami Trigunatita was not only a visionary, he was a creative designer and an ingenious planner as well. Nothing was beyond his vast imagination. The temple architecture now incorporated all the elements and symbols of various world religions that he wished to emphasize in his blending of the East and West culturally, religiously, and spiritually. The towers and symbols represented various religions as well as temples in India. The first tower is a miniature 
of a typical temple in Benares. This tower has a slight resemblance to the top of the Kali temple in Dakshineshwar. The second tower is similar to one of the 12 Shiva Mandir temples of Dakshineshwar. This temple has a combination of symbols at the top. The crescent moon, a Mohammedan as well as Vaishnava symbol of devotion, symbolic of bhakti yoga. Next is the sun, representing the energy required for karma yoga. The third, a trident, representing a scepter of Lord Shiva, symbolic of the destruction of ignorance, or jnana yoga. The third tower on the northeast corner, which is considered a sacred direction in the Hindu tradition, resembles a typical Bengal temple. This tower originally on the two-story temple was physically lifted and placed in the same position on the new third floor. Inside this tower, referred to as the Shiva Tower, worship was performed with utensils from India. The fourth tower represents a European castle, symbolic of strength of character, endurance, and spiritual culture. The tower over the auditorium entrance on Filbert Street resembles a Christian bell tower, a miniature Mohammedan mosque, as well as a partial miniature style of the Taj Mahal of Agra. This tower was used as a plant conservatory, symbolic of nature and natural growth or evolution. The canopy over the mosaic and marble entrance represents the yogic thousand-petaled lotus at the crown of the head and is symbolic of Raja Yoga. The Sanskrit Devanagari inscription reads, Om Namo Bhagavate Ramakrishnaya. Om, salutations to Lord Ramakrishna. On the top of the canopy, a bald eagle, the national bird, is perched with outstretched wings as if it had just landed there. American flags were painted beneath its protecting wings. The Swami compared the three colors, red, white, and blue, of the flag with the three gunas, rajas, sattva, and tamas. He combined yogic references and Hindu philosophy with American symbols of freedom. The arches on the third floor veranda are Moorish in design, similar to many corridors in Indian temples and palaces. The Swami published a pamphlet explaining all of this intricate symbolism of the towers and structure in even more detail, further stating that the temple may be considered a combination of a Hindu temple, a Christian church, a Mohammedan mosque, a Hindu monastery, and an American residence. The construction began at the end of August 1907 and was done by February 1908, all complete within six months in typical Swami Trigunatita fashion. To conceive was to accomplish. The temple with its third floor and towers decorated with American flags and banners was once again dedicated, this time in April 1908, at the Swami's request, the dedication service concluded with the singing of America the Beautiful.
The same year, a painting of Jesus Christ, seated in yoga posture, was added to the auditorium. This unusual rendering of Jesus in the wilderness was conceived by Swami Trigunatita based on a Tibetan picture of Jesus that he had seen and was painted by Theodosia Oliver, a Roman Catholic sympathetic to Vedanta. The painting was hung on the north wall between two of the Moorish style windows. The large oil painting of Sri Ramakrishna, which resembles the photograph taken at Keshap Chandra Sen's house, was painted a few years earlier by Mrs. Claudia Wolberg under the intense guidance of the Swami. Both paintings still hang in the temple. Swami Trigunatita not only built the first Hindu temple in the West, but also made a significant contribution by starting the first monastery, convent, magazine for spreading the teachings of Vedanta and promotion of interfaith understanding and a spiritual colony in Concord in the East Bay. A number of men began living a disciplined life of meditation and study in the monastery under the Swami's strict but loving care. In the quiet pre-dawn hours, the monks would sit on the temple roof or go down near the bay and chant robustly or sing Christian hymns with devotional fervor, which prompted Ernest Brown, a disciple of the Swami, to remark, it must have been a source of wonder to the listening sailors and fishermen. Although the monastery membership has waxed and waned over the years, it has continued since Swami Trigunatita's time. The Swami was also eager to have a convent for women. The Society Minutes for November 1st, 1908 recorded, the nucleus of the first nunnery of the Ramakrishna mission in the Western world was established on October 25, 1908. Some of the women devotees, Mrs. Petit, Mrs. Reynolds, Dr. Sinclair, and Mrs. Alexander agreed to support the convent and began living together in the top flat of the building on the northeast corner of Webster and Filbert Streets, catty corner from the temple. It was a beginning, and though the convent was disbanded in 1912 after a heroic effort, the seeds had been planted for the future convent which exists today. The Victorian house on the corner where it all began still stands. While in India, Swami Trigunatita had started a Bengali magazine, Udbodhan, to the great delight of Swami Vivekananda. He had his heart set on starting a similar magazine for Westerners. In a whirlwind of activity and contagious enthusiasm, the Swami drew everyone into the production of a new magazine to be called The Voice of Freedom. A printing press was set up in the temple basement, and one of the monastery members, Mr. Horvath, offered his services as typesetter. Both Swami Trigunatita and Swami Prakashananda were editors and also wrote for the magazine. Swami Trigunatita was a pioneer in the interfaith movement with the firm belief, Ekam Sad, Vipra, Bahudha, Vedanti, truth is one, sages call it by various names. The Voice of Freedom contained a wide variety of articles covering every major religion, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, 
and of course, Vedanta. And in addition, it included almost every thought current in vogue during the early 20th century. Such was the Swami's breadth of vision and wish to emphasize the unity underlying all religions. The temple also printed postcards of the exterior and interior of the temple, as well as of the painting of Sri Ramakrishna and prints of Jesus Christ. They also printed part one of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, six lessons on Raja Yoga, and a number of booklets. Swami Tragunatita had genuine admiration for America and the ideals of a democratic free society. As with everything, wherever he turned his mind, he was completely engaged. He wholeheartedly adapted himself to the West. <laughs> he made many friends in the city, including the mayor and the firemen next door who helped him with various jobs in the temple. On appropriate days, he would raise American flags from the towers and turrets in patriotic support. He would string the temple with lights and adorn it with red, white, and blue bunting. The Swami even flew flags from Mr. Wahlberg's motor car. In anticipation of the Panama Pacific Exposition to be held in 1915, he procured flags of all participating nations and installed a new system of electric lights, which as one monastery member commented, made the temple look like a fairyland at night. <laughs> the temple had become a landmark in San Francisco. In many ways, so had the Swami. Expanding beyond the precincts of the temple, Swami Trigunatita conceived of a Vedanta colony where Vedantins could retire from city life to intensify their spiritual practices. Again, his vision was transformed into action. Property was purchased in Concord in the East Bay and the experiment was underway and may have blossomed, but was eventually ended and the property sold after the Swami's untimely death. Swami Trigunatita's health had become very precarious, but through superhuman efforts, he continued in the service Swami Vivekananda had entrusted him. He was an uncompromising ascetic and would conduct 24-hour and later 15-hour services on Sri Ramakrishna's birthday and Christmas without moving from the platform for any reason whatsoever. Essentially, these services were prolonged vigils in which he became completely absorbed. The atmosphere in the auditorium was permeated with his exalted state of consciousness. One of the students commented, it was a marvel to those who understood how he kept the body at all. Often the Swami felt that he should let go, but then remarked, the thought would come that the mother's work must go on, and I set my will to force the body to carry on. He had a clear premonition of his approaching death and began preparing the students that great changes would take place in the temple. On December 27, 1914, during his Sunday afternoon lecture entitled The Divine Peace, a mentally unbalanced student walked down the center aisle of the temple and smashed a package several times on the platform. There was a terrible explosion. 
The man was instantly killed. Swami Trigunatita was gravely injured. The Swami's main concern was for that poor, foolish fellow. He told Mrs. Peterson and Mrs. Allen that he had not hurt his head. The Divine Mother, he said, caught me in her arms. As soon as the firemen from next door could get access, they gently assisted him. If the Filbert Street windows had not been blown out, the building would have collapsed. Although the auditorium was in shambles, once again, the temple remained standing. Built as it had been, in Sri Ramakrishna's name and service. Two weeks later, the Swami deliberately gave up his body. On Swami Vivekananda's birthday, January 10, 1915, a bright light was dimmed, but not extinguished. Mrs. Peterson, whom Swami Trigunatita had given the name Dhirananda, steady and firm as a rock, took charge, held the society together, oversaw the temple repairs. Soon the temple was reopened with the students holding classes and giving lectures. Swami Chagunatita's legacy continued with Swami Prakashananda in charge until 1927. From 1915 to 1931, a number of Swamis served at the temple as visiting lecturers, ministers, or assistants, including Swami Abedhananda, another direct monastic disciple of Sri Ramakrishna who was in the West for over 25 years, Swami Prabhavananda, Swami Dayananda, Swami Madhavananda, Swami Vividishananda, and Swami Ashokananda. Another landmark era, 1932 to 1969, began when Swami Ashokananda became minister. A tidal wave of activity and expansion of the Vedanta Society emanated from the Hindu temple under the Swami's extraordinary leadership. A brilliant orator and original thinker, the Swami infused new life and renewed energy into the society. Swami Ashokananda continued Swami Trigunatita's plan for the work on several fronts, including giving many lectures in downtown San Francisco and in the East Bay. During the next few decades, the society began growing dramatically. More dedicated men joined the monastery, some of whom later became sannyasins of the Ramakrishna order. Retreat property was purchased at Lake Tahoe and Olima. Temples were built in Berkeley and Sacramento. Meanwhile, recognizing that the existing temple in San Francisco was too small to accommodate the rapid growth, Swami Ashokananda, after consulting the president of the order, Swami Shivananda, began making plans to build another temple. In 1941, a lot was purchased on the corner of Vallejo and Fillmore Streets, but shortly thereafter, the United States' involvement in the Second World War brought all building plans to a halt. Around this time, the Hindu temple was being referred to as the Old Temple and the proposed temple as the New Temple. Someone later humorously referred to the two temples as the Old Testament and the New Testament. <laughs> Until the temple could be built, the old temple was refurbished from top to bottom. Over the years, 
the auditorium had undergone various changes from which photos or paintings that hung on the walls to the furnishings. A Sunday school was started in the old temple for the society's children, as well as a magazine, The Voice of India, for spreading Vedantic ideas. All of the planning, meetings, and discussions for carrying out all the ongoing and proposed projects were centered in the hub of all activity, the old temple. In addition to this, and to the Swami's personal interviews, classes and lectures continued with the temples packed to the doors. Observance of the birthdays of Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Lord Buddha, Sri Krishna, Christ, and Swami Vivekananda were celebrated with elaborate decorations. Many Swamis from various centers, including India, gave classes and lectures and stayed at the Old Temple over the years. The holy atmosphere of the Old Temple, especially the auditorium created by Swami Trigunatita and others, continued to be sanctified by the meditations and earnest prayers of all those who came after him. In 1948, Swami Ashokananda's first assistant, Swami Shanta Sarupananda, arrived from India, followed in 1957 by Swami Shraddhananda and Swami Swahananda in 1968. The new temple was dedicated in 1959. A few years later, Swami Ashokananda received permission from Balur Mutt to include the then unofficial convent under the umbrella of the Ramakrishna order. Swami Trigunatita's wish for a convent for women was finally established. Swami Ashokananda's health, never robust, deteriorated in the late 60s. He made all preparations for his successor Swami Prabhudhananda, who would be the first minister of the society since Swami Trigunatita's time to live in a building other than the old temple. What had been the convent building adjoining the new temple became the monastery, and the convent was moved down the street to a new location. The society continued to grow during Swami Prabhudhananda's dignified and quiet leadership from 1970 to 2014. The Swami had special reverence for the old temple and all the sacred associations it holds. In the early 70s, he initiated a partial but extensive renovation of the temple. Throughout his ministry, Weekly scripture classes continued to be held in the auditorium, always preceded by meditation. The Sunday school, which had been discontinued, was revived in 1973 with classes in the old temple as before. Over the years, the Swami held special meetings in the auditorium, including the observance of the Society's 75th anniversary. Swami Prabhudhananda's last contribution to the society was to sanction the complete renovation of the old temple from the foundation to the towers. During this arduous process, which began in July 2014, the original cornerstone laid by Swami Trigunatita in 1905 was discovered. A small box within the cornerstone containing documents that had been inserted during the original construction was damaged 
by moisture and had deteriorated as well as its contents. Realizing the historical importance of the temple, which symbolizes our connection to our spiritual roots, Swami Tattwamayananda, minister of the Vedanta Society, traveled to India to obtain the blessings of the senior monks of the Ramakrishna order for this renovation. At his request, messages and signatures of revered Swami Atmastanandaji Maharaj, president of the Ramakrishna Mutt and Mission, the two vice presidents, Swami Smarananda and Swami Prabhananda, and the general secretary, Swami Suhitananda, were obtained. These documents, along with various society publications, including booklets, photographs, and a detailed report of the present activities of the Vedanta Society were added to the original historical documents that could be salvaged and put in a new archival container. The installation ceremony was performed by Swami Tattvamayananda on Guru Purnima, July 31, 2015. The container was then sealed within the foundation of the old temple and may be considered a connecting link to the spiritual inspiration and power that created this extraordinary building dedicated to such a universal ideal. This renovation is a fitting offering to all those, beginning with Swami Trigunatita, whose devotion, meditation, and selfless service have made the old temple, our original temple, what it has always been and will continue to be a holy shrine, but now expanded with modern facilities for multi-purpose use for all those who come in future. Our salutations again and again. Mm -hmm.